Hi folks, Johnny Matthew here again with the third in our series of Troubled Kids sound bites, where we're looking at brief overviews of the chapters in my upcoming book, um, Working with Troubled Children and Teenagers. We talked in the first episode about respect, and in the last episode, the second one, we talked about uh, trust and established some of those key underlying principles about trust that what trust is, this belief in the future of somebody's actions, um, that qualifications are not enough, who we are in our professional role won't cut the mustard, we have to prove ourselves as people, that sequencing matters, that unless we have trust we won't get engagement that we really want, that there is something in the design spec of us as people and the children we work with that wants interdependence, that wants to trust, but that it's a hard thing to do. So I want to spin off from that and just look at the last few things here. And I want, I guess, to point point out what is maybe obvious, but I think is worth say, stating, which is that there is a unique painfulness for these kids in being isolated. Um, and particularly children who've suffered neglect over the years, and particularly in their early years, it's an acutely challenging, difficult and painful place to be, but also to come out from. It's hard to be there and it's hard to trust. But if it's the only thing you've known, that makes it doubly difficult even to move into a place that may be better because it's that better the devil you know kind of situation. Um, so I think if we think about neglect, neglect is quite uh, isolating in itself, obviously, because that's what it is, that nobody is with you, nobody is responding to you, that you are not part of a community and a, a social, interactional and relational family group that works well. That's not there. It's absent for you. So it's isolating. It's also quite numbing because kids get used to not being heard, not being responded to. And when we respond to children, there's a key part of that which helps them to learn to have self-insight. As we respond to them and sort out their problems, listen to their worries and anxieties, they learn to have compassion upon themselves and to empathise with themselves. And if they haven't had that because of a neglectful situation, it's a very difficult place for them to be. And trust is key and earned trust is key in helping them to move from that. So it's isolating, it's numbing, and neglect is also very distancing. It means that kids spend a lot of time on their own, but also even when they're with people, they can be with people, but not really with people. You, We have all been in situations where we felt very alone in a crowded room because we don't know anybody there. And if we project that into a life course trend for some of these kids, that's a really hard place to be. So I guess that leaves us in a place professionally where there's a, a key task that we have to do, which is to remind ourselves constantly that any trust we establish is going to be really important. But more than that, that that trust has to be earned. We have no right to be trusted. We have no right to insist that kids find us trustworthy, obviously. All of that has to be earned and it can only be earned uh, over time. And that's really important. And if you think about where these kids are coming from societally, we give the message, you need to comply or else. So we do it in youth justice. If kids don't comply, then they're threatened with breach and sanctions and kind of more punishment and prosecution and maybe even prison. And we do it in schools. You have to dress a certain way. You have to behave a certain way. You have to pass exams to a certain standard. Otherwise, you are seen to be less than we want you to be. Um, in foster care, as in schools and in youth justice, understandably, there's boundaries and rules. But the emphasis is on compliance, that if you don't get with this programme and do it the way we want you to do it, then unfortunately, you're going to have to move on um, because we, we need you to be different. And clearly, you're not being that way. We do it on the street. We put criminal behaviour orders on kids who make a nuisance of themselves on the street. Now, whilst from a victim's point of view, that makes sense. And it can help the police to do their job of enforcement. And it can bridge some kids into services. But the basic message is, in all of these areas, not just we need you to comply with our rules. We want you to be like us, in other words. 
there's an even more toxic subtext, which is essentially what you already are isn't good enough. And I think that's that's the wrong message to give these kids. And so until we can change that, empathise effectively, and take these kids as they are, accept them as they are, we're going to be struggling uh, and they're going to continue to struggle. So we maybe need to change our mindset about that, understand the importance of trust, the fact that it has to be earned over time and that it's actually running contraflow to a lot of the messages we give kids, which is comply uh, or else. So I guess that brings us right back to the beginning, which is that it's this idea of sequencing again. We want these kids' lives to change. That's what we're shooting for, that where they are is in problem and difficulty and challenge and all of that stuff. And we want them to move through into a place where they can be content and happy and lead fulfilling lives and make a contribution like the rest of us. But there is an order in which that will take place. Change is the last thing that actually unless that's rooted in acceptance and trust through which we gain their engagement, we'll never get change. That order is really important. They have to feel accepted by us. They will only learn over time to trust us, believe in what we're going to be like tomorrow and the next day and next month. Only when they believe in us then they trust us, will they engage fully with us and we'll know fully who they are and how they are and what they want and we can promote their aspirations and their rights and their needs and their protection and so on. And then we'll get change. But it can only really come in that order. So there we go. That's the second instalment of Trust. Um, Thank you for listening. Next time we are going to talk about motivation. What is it in us that motivates to do these sometimes very difficult jobs that we do with troubled kids and teenagers. So once again, thanks for listening. Um, if you want more information, hop over onto johnnymatthew.com slash book, where you can register an interest and sign up for the email list if you want. And there's a link on there for the publishers page. Uh, if you want to go through to Jessica Kingsley Publishers um, to see what they're saying about the book. So thanks for listening. Keep on keeping going. Hang in there. Build trust. There's no other way. There's no shortcut, but when it happens, it's magic. Bless you. See you next time. Cheers.